Now, for many of us, the extent of our magazine reading is flicking through the pages and then kind of, I suppose, tossing it out with the recycling. I mean, overall, they don't play a very important part in our lives necessarily. I mean, who needs a magazine when you've got Google, right? But for some, magazines are every bit as important as some of the great literary works. As important as Google itself, the minefields of quirky articles and images and information that should be treasured. One such man who enjoys a good magazine is James Hyman, and he owns the largest magazine collection in the world. The largest magazine collection in the world. James, welcome to the programme. James, how many magazines do you estimate you own? At the moment, it's 70,000, near on, near enough. Um, we're getting incredible amounts of donations, so that's increasing. I would say at about 20% a year, that will go up, and we are being flooded with stuff. So it's, it's Wait a minute, flooded. you're getting donations? That's cheating. Do you not go to a shop, buy the magazine, read it, and then hold on to it? Dave, I do that as well. I subscribe. I, I devour magazines. I look on eBay, Gumtree. I'm constantly acquiring magazines, but we also have some lovely humanitarians out there who, you know, donate a lot of magazines. Wow. Well, I'll tell you, I'm with you there. I love magazines and I read a lot of magazines, but they're usually quite kind of narrow, either something to do with movies or music. So, um, first of all, why did you start collecting magazines? When did you start collecting magazines? And more importantly, was it a conscious decision or did it just happen? Did you suddenly realise, wow, I have a thousand magazines, let's get 70? What happened was, I mean, the major tipping point was I was a scriptwriter for MTV Europe in the late 80s and early 90s. Now, people forget the internet has not always existed. Back then, there was no internet. So your great source of rich content, I had to write about things for the presenters to say on air, like coming up now is a new Prince video, blah, blah, blah. Now, obviously, with videos being repeated and repeated, you had to make that con sound good. What was a great source? Magazines. So I started collecting them for this job, and then I would do a lot of other jobs in broadcasting and media, and, you know, always found magazines were a great, fantastic source, and they still are. Don't get me, you know, Google does not have everything. Not everything is on Google. And they're an amazing source of content for ideas, as you said earlier, you know, the best images, the best photographs, the best articles, journalists, illustrations really have all existed and still continue to do so in magazines. So I collected them throughout my career. In about 2011, I thought, right, my wife was nagging me saying, you've got all this stuff in storage, you've got to do something with it. Because I mean, literally, you know, floors were just collapsing under the weight. They all went into storage, got them out of storage. And for a year, with an incredible archivist called Tory Turk, we spent a year sorting them all out got into the Guinness Book of Records as the largest collection of magazines. And then for the last three years, we've been looking into the prospect of commercializing this content by having it all online and accessible to the world. Wait a minute, commercializing this content, digitizing, I presume, is what you're talking about Digitizing as well. it, but making it commercially available. So basically people can access it. Yes, digitizing it. And would you be getting the money out of this? This sounds like a, a lucrative well, business. Well, you know what? It's, it, it, look, it's, it's not just me getting the money because actually it's an amazing thing where the photographers, the illustrators, the publishers, the authors, they would also get a share mm. of the money. We want people to also be paid for their work. We don't want to just be greedy. And also there is the cultural legacy of it. I, I really passionately would love this stuff preserved. I don't want it to end up in a, yeah. in a skip or on a bonfire. There is an absolute incredible cultural, historical importance Absolutely, to all that stuff. And also, like, so much of it just should never be kind of just thrown into the bin and, and discarded completely. Because when I said earlier on, I was trying to be as glib as possible, saying mm. we have Google out there. Google uh, it, it takes care of about, what, about, about 5% of what's in these magazines. Dave, you're absolutely right. Look, Google is brilliant. Don't get me wrong. You put a search in Google, it comes up with stuff. It convinces you that what you've got there is good. But it's not good enough. I know from a lot of work we've mm. done, we did work for the VNA Bowie exhibition, loads of requests we get when people, we did one recently where someone wanted brilliant magazine Christmas covers for the BBC. You know, all this stuff is mm. not on Google and it's valuable content. No, absolutely, 100%. Now, um, the magazines, I presume, there's obviously a lot of music ones, you've alluded to that. What yeah. other types? I mean, are we talking about, do you know the way when you see, um, what is it, Have I Got News For You? Yeah. And uh, um, they have a little thing of, like, what are these headlines? They always have the most ridiculous, like Beagle Monthly or Veranda Weekly or something. Do you have those kind of magazines as well? We don't go that. I mean, we've we definitely got some obscure zines, counterculture. Basically, the remit is popular culture, so that right. does encompass music, film, 
fashion, entertainment, sport, technology. There's a lot of quirky, weird stuff. But, you know, for example, you know, knitting monthly or yeah. sort of some really ones I, I would not really fit that remit. But you could have a magazine like Cigar Aficionado, which you wouldn't think was pop culture. But when you've got Arnie chewing on a fat course, Cuban on the yeah, front of that, yeah. that's pop culture. Yeah, and therefore, like when you say that you s- that decided to what? Categorise, digitise, get it all together to put it onto some kind of thing on the internet. If you've been at that, I would imagine that's a four-year job minimum, is it? It's a long job in basically, we're waiting for a licence that allows us to mass, mass digitise. And then you've also got the important part. There are two important things here to deal with because the copyright can be dealt with, but the important part is also tagging all that material. You know, you, know, you might have an incredible picture of a pair of red boots, but did you know they are Bowie's red boots worn at this Ziggy Stardust store? Who was the photographer? Where was it taken? There was also the importance of creating analytical tools for this content. So you could do timelines, popularity graphs, basically making that data that's in the magazines rich, you know, comparing who's more popular, I don't know, Beatles or Stones, the, the timeline of Bob Dylan's gigs throughout New York in a specific magazine, or what connects Stanley Kubrick to Tarantino in the 90s. <laughs> Good luck with all that, James. That's Thank a you. lifetime. That's not it four is. years. It's not. It's an ongoing project, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> we'll do it. All right, by the way, just as a matter of interest, I mean, like, you know, we used to get magazine. In fact, I mean, we've been getting the enemy in our house. I've got very older brothers since the very late 50s, early 60s, believe it or not, and they threw them all out. Oh, he, no. Oh, but hold on a second, hold on. With the NME, what he did was, throughout the 1960s, he cut out every single charts bit, like with all just the charts, and he put them into a box. So like the, the other side of the charts was the news pages. So it's like Townsend says pictures of Lily is not pornographic and Cliff to leave shadows and all this kind oh, of stuff. Oh. So all that new stuff. But like, I mean, I remember bringing the 1962 one of Love Me Do or whatever, straight into number 17 by the Beatles, and Paul McCartney signed it for me. And I have all those charts from the 60s, but I don't have yeah. the magazines. Well, we've got them all. We've got them. And let me just say, if I can, to all your listeners and people out there, anyone who wants to donate any stuff, please get in t- touch with us at hymanarchive.com because we are getting an incredible amount of donations. We don't, you know, people, it's an amazing place for this stuff to go and be preserved. Okay, just, I'll, I'll give that, uh, that address out again. We just, um, if, when you collect certain titles, are you obsessive about having all of the issues? Good question. I used to be really have anxiety, but again, over the process, I've become more zen because I, a lot of the gaps do get filled. You can never be, have a complete collection of absolutely every popular culture magazine and I hunt stuff down and I'm very chilled about it I used to as I say years and years ago oh my god oh that one's slightly torn or I'm going on holiday I'm going to miss one don't have that anxiety anymore they are beautifully filled in time as and when and are any of the ones like any specific individual copy worth billions like say the first Batman comic from 1806 or something well yeah I mean the Superman comics regularly fetch a couple of million Oz magazines can regularly go for 400 500 pounds it really is dependent on what someone wants to pay for that magazine at that time again you can often have if it belongs to somebody famous then the value of that collection will go up or a specific magazine they fluctuate in price but I believe in years to come they're going to become Come worth even more. I mean, I've seen bizarre things. An article on, you know, Jeremy Holmes. I think was it Jeremy Holmes or somebody who played Sherlock Holmes. And it's gone, you know, it was an article in Time Out going for like £800 just for that issue. Alan Rickman stuff, again, mm. specific articles on Hinner magazines go for ludicrous prices. So it really is what someone will pay for it and how desperately they want that. You know, the, the other thing about it is that an awful... Jeremy Brett, sorry, Jeremy Brett. All right, OK, yeah, uh, he played Holmes. Uh, the, the other oh. thing about it is is that, like, people collect magazines all the time or they keep their magazines or they don't want to throw them out or they spend eight quid a week on them or whatever it is and suddenly they really have to move or they're moving house but they like to think they might give them a good home. So mm. yours is a good home, isn't it? It's an incredible home. I genu- Look, it really is. And I mean, testament to people who have realised that. Pensioner last week had 30 years of Time magazine and New Scientist. He really mm. wanted us to have them. So it is a good home. Uh, are you, like, for instance, pining after any magazine? Is there anything that you are so obsessed about or have been down through the years that you'd love to get your hands on it but you just can't? There are many. I mean, as I say, you know, I go into a magazine shop in, here in London in Soho, Wardour News, and it's prolific, the amount of new titles. So I'm constantly, I, I feel happy. I feel like a pig in SHIT. You know, I'm rolling around in the mud of magazines and there's nothing I desperate look I like the first playboy in immaculate condition but it will come in time when and you know as and when and are you or should I say is your collection insured it is 
certainly insured. And another reason why it should be digitised, because in a way that is a form of insurance. Digitising it all will protect it. Yeah, I presume you're insured for fire and theft, are you? <laughs> Indeed, and water. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Uh, OK, so um, are any of, of them actually, like, do you have collector's items or do you only have certain magazines that you didn't include in your stash? Like, you know, are, are they all collector's items, if you think about it? In a way they are, because, again, I've seen sales. You know, the, the weirdest thing, some people sometimes want a magazine for a specific article or picture. There might be a, an article on Kate Moss in there or an article on somebody or a photographer that on the cover didn't look interesting, but specifically someone collects Banksy, for example. The artist was in an early, I don't know, Sleaze Nation or something. So, yeah, I mean, pretty much every magazine to somebody will be collectible. You do realise that it really is a lifetime sort of, um, you know, work in, ahead of you. So, you know, after it you... It has been already, Dave. I've yeah, spent 25 just, years collecting them. Really, yeah. No, but I'm just thinking, like, the whole digitising thing. I mean, that's... That, like, it's going to be very difficult to do all that. You know that, don't you? <laughs> I do, but we've got some fantastic teams and people ready in, in place. So, yeah, it's not. this is not just going to be me. This is teamwork. And they will live on because of this, and I presume live past you, and maybe your kids maybe will take it up and you know, we'll curate the whole lot. Please, God, they do, and if they don't, someone will carry on the mission. And when you were MTVing, by the way, just back there, was it every mm. single magazine, or was it, like, all the smash hits and all that? All the smash hits, Empire, The Face, ID, Enemies, Melody Makers, Select, Vox, you name it, I had it. Are magazines less popular than they used to be are many like a, a lot of them like I mean, for instance like all the music magazines Sounds is gone Melody Maker is gone Select is gone they're yeah, yeah. true and the lads mags have just gone FHM but no they are more popular than ever particularly in the independent sector certainly far from dying and what about the dandy and the beano etc that kind of thing got a lot of those comics sure and that's ongoing too want to keep them going so tons of comics Buster Whoopi Monster Fun DC Marvel sure they're going and to. if you had the dandy and the beano would you get the free boomerang in them you need them. That, gives, that does give you value. 2018, <laughs> the little spaceship thing on issue one. You need those three gifts too. Yeah, where, where do you store all this stuff, James? Warehouse in Woolwich called The Stock Room. They look after a lot of other media companies too, film companies and TV companies, so it's, it's a good fit. It's in Woolwich, SC18. Well, listen, you have a mountain of stuff in front of you and a mountain of work to get all this stuff digitised, and I wish you well. If people want to get in touch in any way at all, James Hyman, where do they go? They go to hymanarchive.com, have a look around, and then get in touch if you've got any magazines you want to donate or any other inquiries. That's H-Y-M-A-N, hymanarchive.com. James, Indeed. the very best of luck with your quest ahead. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks.